Welcome to Sunday Mornings at the Marxist Library. A quick note before we start, this session is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube with a link to our website. Our website is icssmarx.org, and that will be up in a few days. Before the pandemic, this program was hosted at the Niebel Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland, California, USA. But during the pandemic, ever since, we've been meeting on um, Zoom every Sunday morning. And we have participants now from all over the country and indeed all over the world. So let me welcome everybody and say not only good morning, but good afternoon and good evening. For over a decade and a half, Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library has brought programs to a, uh, on a diverse variety of subjects, um, including political economy, capitalism, communism, the struggles of the workers, struggles for racial and gender equality and, and such. We welcome a diversity of opinions. You definitely do not have to be a Marxist to be a participant, either a presenter or to join our programs. We invite you to, to um, visit us. However, we, the Institute for the Critical Study of Society, the ICSS, ICSS, are united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx. And we believe that that work remains relevant today. Our motto is taken from Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. You can sign up for email notifications for future programs, past programs, and contact us through our website, icss.marx. We welcome input, feedback, suggestions for topics, and speakers. My name is Roger Harris, and I'm on the program committee for the ICSS, Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. Before we start, I wish to remind everyone that this is a comradely forum for political discourse and debate. As such, we ask that you show respect for our participants, for the moderator, and for the speaker. Please note that the opinions expressed are those of the speaker and the participants. They are not necessarily the opinions of the ICSS or the Marxist library. And now after the presentation, which will be about 45 minutes, we'll take a short break, make announcements, and then we'll have a robust Q&A, and that will end about 12.30 um, Pacific time. And the topic for today's discussion is a bleak road ahead for the global economy. Um, what we are noticing right now is that the period of rapid ca capitalist growth is declining. The, and um, the major economic um, institutions of the capitalist economy, the IMF, the World Trade um, Association, Organization, the World Bank, they're all predicting lower growth expectations, expectations. Our speaker today will be addressing this phenomenon. What is the causes and what are the consequences of this bleak road ahead for the world economy. Our speaker um, is one that we've had before, and we welcome once again, Greg Godels. Um, Greg grew up in a working class family in a rural coal mining community. He joined the Communist Party in 1975 and served on the party's economics commission. He, Greg has wrote frequently for the Daily World and other papers as well as political affairs and nature, science, society, and thought. Articles by him have appeared in very numerous publications, including the Communist Review, which comes out of London, the People's Voice out of Vancouver, and Socialist Voice out of Dublin. He is a joint founder of the website Marxism Leninism Today. We highly recommend that website and writes a highly regarded blog under the pen name Zoltan Ziggy. And we recommend uh, Greg's article, which is the uh, top, also the topic of today's talk, which is in today's chat. So, Greg, welcome to the ICSS, and please tell us about the bleak road ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm uh, happy to have an opportunity to discuss the article. The article was entitled uh, "The End of an Era," and uh, it. Uh, to my uh, satisfaction, it was picked up by a number of sites, uh, Dissident Voice, um, 
the People's Voice, the Canadian Communist Party paper, and the Morning Star, which is the only daily English language Marxist oriented paper uh, in the UK and uh, North America. And it was translated into Italian on uh, a Marxist Leninist website called Resistenza. But this is the first opportunity I've had to actually discuss this. So um, I hope to elaborate a bit more on that article, a little bit more in, of the background for it and, uh, and what it means. Let's begin by saying what the um, method here is. I like to believe it's historical materialism. And those of you, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the writings of Marx and Engels, that really emanates from the German ideology, first section of German ideology, where they outline, the, uh, Marx and Engels outline a notion of how history evolves. It's an evolutionary story. We don't have to go deeply into it, but it predates Darwin and his, his notion of evolution, published in 1959 in The Origin of Species, by many years. But it applies that evolutionary notion to society, to uh, social formations. So hopefully that's what I wrote in the spirit of. And uh, that's not very fashionable today. Today, uh, since the era, since the late 20th century, uh, the impact of postmodernism, French philosophy, uh, and many other currents, academic currents, that has fallen out of favor. The idea of a overarching um, narrative, uh, an account of historical development is frowned upon by uh, most academics in this country. But this was written in that spirit. That's why the term era is so critically important. Let's stop for a minute and talk about the way Marx and Engels uh, spoke of uh, landmark mo uh, moments in history. They talked about modes of production and how they evolved one to another. That was one kind of understanding of the way history evolved. Lenin wrote about stages, and we should get caught up in the words, but most of you are familiar with Lenin's imperialism, the final, the last stage of, of capitalism. But that was written to identify a stage within capitalism, a, uh, a point, a historical juncture within capitalism. And of course, when we look at that notion, we can identify several, several different junctures preceding that era. Uh, Pre-capitalism, which was uh, a proto-capitalism, mercantilism, that era when capitalism was just evolving, capital accumulation was occurring. It was followed by another stage of industrial capitalism, which we're familiar with. And that in turn in the late 20th, uh, late 19th century was followed by monopoly capitalism. Lynn we'll called that the era of imperialism. So within the era of capitalism, within the era of monopoly capitalism, we can divide things into finer grains, even smaller uh, social changes. For example, after Great Depression, capitalism, the ruling elites made adjustments to the way capitalism was structured in order to account for a crisis. Wars create those kind of crises, as do um, economic collapses, um, disputes, and so forth. So we can identify those kind of errors, which are real attempts to protect and preserve capitalism going forward. So in 1933, uh, with the New Deal, we saw certain features shifted and changed in the way capitalism went forward. And in the post-war era, we saw uh, similar kinds of changes that occurred. After the, in a post-war era, and this is, we have to give examples to really uh, bring this to life. In the post-war era, we saw US political hegemony. We saw the dominating ideology of anti-communism, and it was united around the United States. We saw the development of many global capitalist institutions. The backing, again, the return to the gold standard in that era, and the backing of the US dollar by the gold standard. Uh, the dominance of US monopolies. If you go into the era from 1945 until the late 1960s, U.S. monopolies were the dominant forces, and they gave a clear picture to people of what a monopoly capitalism was. For example, in the auto industry, you had three major companies dominating the entire thing. Um, and uh, that was captured very nicely by the book Monopoly Capitalism that Sweezy and Baran wrote. Unfortunately, 
the crisis that occurred in 1970, in the early 1970s, and that challenged that entire era. And what happened, of course, in 1970, many of you are familiar with, but it was essentially, essentially the uh, growth of com competition again. So Japan and, uh, and Germany emerged as rivals for US capitalism, rivals for US monopolies. We saw the oil crisis in which um, new countries, countries involved in oil production were emboldened by the liberation movements that occurred in that era, up to that area. And of course, the culmination of the liberation movements was the gross defeat of the United States in the 1970s in Vietnam. So all these created a, a crisis of capitalism that the ruling classes in this country and other countries had to address. How did they address it? Beginning in the, in the uh, last years of that decade, actually in the, in the, um, in the uh, Carter administration, the new changes occurred and a departure from the old model, which was developed uh, after the war uh, began to occur, culminated in what came to be called Reaganism and many of you call neoliberalism and eventually globalization. So we need to talk about that era. That's the era that we are in and I'm arguing we're leaving. What are the features of that area, era? What, what defines that era? It was a turn to market fundamentalism. And the era prior to that was one that was dominated by um, a Keynesian model, a model of state intervention and a social safety net, um, a number of other features like that. There was a compact with labor in the 50s made in, 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 in return for labor support for the Cold War agenda that the United States put forward. There was a unspoken, unwritten compact with the US ruling class that labor could expect to get a return commensurate with the growth in labor productivity in this country. That was a kind of unspoken thing. And of course, the, the labor um, leadership that took over after the purges of the left were perfectly happy with that. That's the way they sold their approach to, uh, to a collaboration with business. So that was a feature of that era. That, that feature was attacked with Reaganism. That compact was thrown under the bus and the attack on labor began in earnest in that era. I'm speaking of the United States, of course, it was happening in other places as well. Um, privatization and deregulation emerged in a big way. It's always been a, a feature of the right wing in this country, but it emerged in a big way because during the prior uh, administration, there were concessions made to public to, to, to public institutions, the growth of public institutions. Um, the regulation of industry was a factor in it. That was overturned in that era as well. That began to be overturned in that era as well. Um, the safety net was being dismantled. Later in that same era, the era we're living in, later in that same era, uh, around the late 70s, we saw a vast uh, labor force unleashed on the global economy, which further energized that area people have come to call neoliberalism, globalization. That, of course, is when China made the decision to open up to the global market. So a whole reservoir of, of uh, low-paid, low-paying labor then entered the global economy. Of course, industry and, and investment went into that, into that area. With the fall of the Soviet Union in 91, that era was again, gener uh, uh, was again uh, energized by an entirely new reservoir of labor entering into the global economy. So we see in that period after the crisis of the 70s, a new era emerge, an area that is, you could characterize as market fundamentalism where the market came first, of commodification of everything, of deregulation, of privatization, of an attack upon labor and very little resistance from labor. And what, what drove that and drove back the rate of profit, which was lost in the 70s because of the competition with Japan and Germany, what restored that was low, low labor costs. Low labor costs were everywhere. In addition, there was a scientific technological revolution. And 
impact of global trade in a particularly important way because containerization became a reality. It became a force. The use of GPS and, and, and transporting uh, goods around the world became a, a major factor. And so this period lasted was, and, and of course it grew and it benefited the ruling class most of all. In fact, during that period, if you map, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, if you map the average um, um, workers' income, workers' compensation, hourly income, from the early 70s all the way into the modern era, this contemporary era, it just goes down and down and down. It's, it's, it's static, it doesn't grow. It goes up and down, but in a very narrow range. There's very little gains for workers. And it became an era of enrichment of an, an enormous super accumulation. Well, that, that can't go on forever. That just simply couldn't go on forever. And the era we, the crisis comes for that era, for that era of globalization, that era of uh, neoliberalism in the 21st century. And that's when um, the first crisis in 2000 hammered uh, the global economy. And then, of course, the, 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 the Great Recession of 2007 through 2009 added on to that, and we have a further recession that's just emerging, but started in 2019, as further collapse. So capitalism in this new era, in this new era is now entering a period of crisis. Now, uh, let's review quickly what that era, what that era's features, main features were. One was the mobility of capital. During the post 1970s era, until the 21st century. Capital was mobile, it went around the world, shipped it to China, invested heavily in China, invested in Vietnam, invested in numerous countries in Eastern Europe. Uh, auto, the auto industry shifted around to countries all through Europe and so forth. So there was great mobility of capital. The new areas of capital penetration uh, rose. China, for example, the people's, uh, people's China became a source of an enormous, enormous pile of, uh, of workers, of workers freed from agriculture to go into manufacturing. There was a global division of labor, uh, which, which followed that because as manufacturing left the United States and went into these, these uh, other places where uh, labor costs were so low, what was left for the United States was financialization for a fire, the, uh, the, uh, the financial sector. And so that became this divisional labor put that here and in London and a few other places. That became a huge industry and a huge part of profitability in this country, whereas production occurred in other countries and left this area. And of course, with that accumulation of capital that I spoke of, there was this massive revolution in financial instruments. Uh, all those acronyms you may remember from 07 through 09 it collapsed. They were new financial instruments. They were bundles of securities, bundles of bonds, bundles of, of, uh, of uh, mortgages, and so forth. These were all new and innovative ways to find a place to put the super accumulation that occurred in that, that, that era of globalism from 1980 through the 21st century. And of course, they collapsed. That's what, that's what led to the uh, collapse. Trade barriers were removed in that period. So, and, and new trade agreements were struck. So that was an area where the barriers that existed from, from the uh, pre-1970 were struck down and the free flow of goods, free flow of services, free flow of finance and investment occurred. And trade agreements were further enhanced to, to smooth that, to lubricate that uh, development. And we saw an explosion of trade in that era, an explosion of the growth of trade. In fact, many scholars and academics were writing about how um, we'd entered an entirely new era of the, the reduction of the importance of the nation state and the increasing importance of capitalism, transnational capitalism, because trade had become such a massive factor and, and capitalist corporations were, were, were everywhere. They had their, their headquarters everywhere. One of, the, one of the most striking features of that period, the period that I'm arguing we're leaving, was the commodification of everything. I mean, it, it permeated not just the economic realm, which of course it did, but it went into our culture, 
went into our life, went into our relationships, went into our media, everything became, took on a price. So things like highways, which were developed as open to everybody, funded by the state and open to everybody for use, then uh, acquired a price tag. So they tried to toll everything. They told parking spaces. Everything became commercialized. Everything became commodified. That was a feature of that era. And of course, um, when the crash came in the 21st century, the crashes came in the 21st century, many people thought at that time it was the end of the era. I can cite several, Robert Wright, um, Jeffrey Sachs, all the prominent liberal and uh, left of center, Dean Baker, all of these economists were saying this era, especially 2007 to 2009, is the death of neoliberalism, the death of that era of, um, of uh, market fundamentalism. But they were wrong, and I was wrong. I wrote in 2008, in the midst of this severe global crisis, that the crisis was the, was the most severe since the Great Depression, and that uh, globalization was coming to an end and its centrifugal forces were occurring. You'd expect that all this would unwind because of this great crisis. When, whenever you have a situation where um, profitability is dropping dramatically, where people, where, where companies are falling, where, where insecurity arises, everyone runs for shelter. Everyone runs to cover their own behind. Everyone. Everyone looks to uh, to save themselves at the expense of everything else, and you see a collapse of cooperation, a collapse of the institutions that are there. So I expected these centri centrifugal forces to occur, and the existing alliance blocks, institutions, the common solutions were going to disappear. I was wrong, and so uh, were most of the other, most of the liberal pundits that were writing about this. Even at that time, even questioned the existence of the EU. I thought these centrifugal, centrifugal forces would break the EU apart. I wasn't that far wrong because in 2011 and 2012 and 2013, it was pretty, it was pretty uh, precarious with the great crisis, the Irish crisis, and then the Southern European um, uh, debt situation. It really almost cracked, but it did hold together. And, and the question for all of us to ask ourselves is how did that happen? How did that hold together? How did that not bring down that era of market uh, fundamentalism, that area of neoliberalism? Why did the concentrical forces fail to bust the global economy apart? The answer is twofold. One was uh, the elites readopted, reaccepted interventionism, something that was forbidden during that whole era. That's just what they didn't want to do. They were ideologically disposed not to have the state intervene in any way, shape, or form in the economy. That was, that was a heresy. But they did intervene, and the intervention was through mainly the Federal Reserve in the U.S. and the central banks in the other countries. In, in the United States, it was something called quantitative easing, or QE, and it was an attempt, and I'll read how I described it in an earlier post. The great economic collapse of 2007 through 9 exhausted the vitality and epic of globalism, capitalist internationalism, a period that lasted over two decades. Vast sums of hyper-accumulated capital channeled into riskier and riskier speculation of process that eventually collapsed from its own arrogance. That was the 2007 through 9 crisis. Rather than surrender to the inevitability of creative destruction, it was a term created by Joseph Schumpeter, I'll go back to that later, a process that always naturally follows a crash, the natural process of sweeping away the toxic assets left in the wake of a crash, the great financial wizards and the financial centers of New York, London, Paris, and Zurich, et cetera, sought to isolate, protect, and sustain the garbage of the disaster and inflate the deflated economy through creative restoration. It's a play on creative destruction, but what, what a crisis like, um, 2007 to, through 2009 is, in its essence, is a crisis of deflation. By that, I mean values, things that appear to be values, or perhaps fictitious values, but that appear to be values by most people, 
most of the stuff of Wall Street, most of the derivatives, most of the financial instruments, that stuff deflates dramatically. When the collapse occurs, the financial crisis occurs, it falls apart. So you have a tremendous of, uh, destruction of notional value. But it didn't work that way. The Federal Reserve and its counterparts bought all that, excuse the expression, crap up and isolated it. They put it in a strong box, which, which kept the values of the stock market and so on at a higher level than it would have been. So the process that would have been similar to the Great Depression, that kind of a crash, was foregone. It didn't happen. Um, they believed that they possessed the financial tools that would stabilize and resuscitate the global economy without a period of retrenchment and the accompanying economic setbacks. Central banks spent trillions to buy the worthless assets and place them in a lockbox until values could be restored and sold back in the market. Eventually, they would creep back in as values came up. They embarked on an unprecedented decade of free money, and this is the other factor that they created, ultra-low interest rates to allow sickly, unprofitable, and marginal enterprises to live on life support and to compete another day. The discipline of the market, the winners and losers, gave way to state intervention to keep everyone in the game. So here we have the, the intervention again of the state in the form of the Federal Reserve and, uh, and, uh, and other instruments in the economy, sparing capitalism from this creative destruction that Schumpeter talked about. If you go back and read Joseph Schumpeter, he sees that as a feature. And most economists recognize that of a downturn. A downturn is a destruction, a resetting of the table. Get rid of the garbage. It didn't happen in seven, eight, and nine. It was, it was pushed aside. And then we get this period of long, low interest rates, which meant that a company that was marginal, that could barely serve, just barely survive 2009 and 10 and would have went down the drain, can borrow and borrow and borrow upon on, on that borrowing and virtually no interest. So money became free. And it gave a sense of, 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 uh, uh, of everything, of recovery during that entire period. So my argument is that, in fact, that was the beginning of the end. But, but for two decades, a, a decade afterwards, capitalism was able to put lipstick on that pig uh, going forward. But the reckoning had to come, and the reckoning is coming now. It's a, a, a recent Wall Street Journal uh, headline captured it. The new world order is unwinding. From 2011 to 2010, there have only been two years where world trade grew as a percentage of GDP. So that decade until now is one in which all the features of globalism the preceding period are gone. Global trade is actually has actually been shrinking. Bank loans to borrowers in other countries as a percentage of GDP is now close to a 20 year low. So that mobility of capital that I described earlier, which was a feature of the globalist era, era is gone. It's, it's disappeared too. We've now got a long term 20 year trend where that's not as of any. As you know, one of the features that was attributed to Trump, but was retained by the current regime were sanctions, tariffs, and other ways of, of discouraging uh, uh, exchanges with other countries, principally with China and Russia, but also with other countries. So we went to a, a variable trade war, and U.S. duties now collected as a percentage of total imports is at a 30-year high. So the doors that swung open for trade, the doors that swung open for globalism, the trade agreements and so forth, is now at a 30-year low. That's not occurring. In fact, it's reversing itself. So what we're seeing is a new era, the emergence of a new era. And the old era, the old era is the main feature of the old era that we're experiencing in the moment, of course, is inflation. And what is inflation? What is inflation? I wrote two years ago when it first appeared on, on the scene, it was a commonplace among 
less than economists to dismiss it. So it's just a matter of, of um, supply chains. It's just a matter of the pandemic and the recovery from the pandemic. It'll go away. And I argued it's, this is a time very much like the 70s of stagflation, very much like the time when inflation again came uh, uh, as, as, as a, a reflection of, a, of the global crisis that we're entering into, of, of the loss of, uh, of the rate of profit that occurred in that era. And so as time emerged, the, the economists, the Wall Street economists in particular, said, well, yeah, the, the CPI, which we normally pay attention to, is not really what should be paid attention to. We should pay attention to the core inflation rate. Why? Because that eliminates cost of oil, cost of fuel, eliminates fuel costs. They're very volatile. So for the next year, that was the focus because that was a smaller number. And now in this year, the, the higher number, which was the classic CPI, is actually coming down a bit because oil prices came down and food prices have been up and down. But the core thing, which was at the heart of their argument, that's what we pay attention to is actually going up again. It went up again in, in May. In the article I cite April, it went up, but it went up again in May at the same time. So we're going to have inflation around for a long time. But what is inflation? In this case, you recall that I characterized the, the crisis in 7 through 9, 2007, 8, and 9 as a deflationary crisis, a crisis that created a massive deflation, which was reinflated by QE. And what we have now is an overshoot. We have an overshoot, and it creates a vast dilemma for the masters of our economic universe. Because what they want to do is they want to cool the inflation. And the way they want to do it is to actually um, cause another recession, to take us back to where we were in 7, 8, and 9 in order to reduce, and the principal thing is to reduce the cost of labor. Of course, liberals are all up in arms, and they should be. The people that are going to be hurt by this are working people. But remember, the whole reason that this last era existed, the, the air, the inflation, the, the, the very fuel that kept it going was this enormous reservoir of, of educated, fairly sophisticated labor to join the global market after 1978 with People's China and after 1991 with the loss of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. This, this is gone now. Now, that the, the, as we can see, we have labor shortages everywhere. So for, for, for liberal economists to say dismiss what they're doing, they have no answer. They don't want to manage capitalism now like they normally do. Most of our social democratic friends, most of our friends in the Democratic Party, they like to think that there's a better way of managing capitalism than the way that Trump was managing it or that Biden is. They're managing it in a very similar way today, but they think there's a better way. There isn't, and they've given up. The example of modern monetary theory, which was the rage three years ago. I perhaps had somebody on this, this podcast to discuss modern monetary theory. It was the rage. It's collapsed. Nobody's interested in it anymore because it doesn't fit the moment and it can't fit the moment. It just doesn't exist. So it's a profound crisis moment. It's a grand dilemma for the people that, the brains that run the, the capitalist economy. So the question then is, if this is in fact the end of an era, what is coming? What is forthcoming? What's, what's uh, around the corner? Well, obviously, it's speculation. I, I, can't, I can't tell you for sure. But I have some ideas about the new era. I see economic, political, military, and social conflict. I see that as expressed as populism, the growth of radical, primarily right-wing populist parties around the world is, is an answer to this crisis. You can, you can uh, and, and rightly so, you should regret, rightfully so, the rise of a racist component to much of this, uh, the fascistic component to some of this, it should be condemned. But, but you cannot escape the fact that it's a response to the ending of this era. It's just as right-wing movements in the past have been responses to the ends of era. And that has to be addressed. That has to be faced squarely. We can't just be in a defensive mode. We have to answer to this coming era. 
It's expressed as rising nationalism. That means the shutting of these doors of trade, the shutting of these doors of cooperation, the shutting of these doors of identifying with other peoples. It's this expressed as protectionism, trade barriers, tariffs, and sanctions. My God, even the liberal press is talking about how the U.S. is sanctioning everybody and everything. Provocations, arms bills are filled up. Intense competition replacing cooperation, uh, broken global institutions. And of course, and most, most frighteningly, war. Uh, quoting from the article, we can see that we are entering a period of growing uncertainty and conflict. The rise of right-wing populism has spawned a strong dissatisfaction with conventional answers and a rise in nationalism and protectionism. Governments in Europe, Hungary, Poland, Italy, the Baltics, in Asia, India, India Turkey, Taiwan, the recent election of Erdogan again, the re-election, Japan, et cetera. I cite my article that Japan is increasing its military budget, which is against our constitution dramatically because of the, the, the current world, the new emerging world order. They're taking a decided rightward turn, embracing militarization, sectarianism, anti-liberalism, and nationalism. U.S. and its allies are no longer the champions of free markets, employing tariffs, sanctions, and other aggressive winner-take-all measures. The alliances and the rules of the game that were established in the 1990s in the first decade of the 21st century are now crumbling. Global leadership is now contested with the war dangers that ensue. The win-win illusions of globalization are mutating into the veracity of grab whatever you can. We have not seen in memory a period where the U.S. and its allies simply steal the financial assets of a country like Venezuela or Russia with impunity. All signs point to not a world order, but a world disorder with alliances coming and going between all allies and all enemies. And Saudi Arabia cooperates with Russia in terms of uh, OPEC plus, and then it'll turn around and condemn Russia on another, another factor. It's, it's basically global opportunism today. Turkey can attack Russian planes over Syria and sell drones in Russia to use against Ukraine. Saudi Arabia can assist fundamentalists in killing Russians in Syria and broker a global oil deal. Russian and sell weapons to both, People's China and India, as tensions rise between the two. The U.S. can destroy pipelines that offer cheap Russian energy to Germany with impunity, while the U UAE sells sanctioned Russian oil back to Germany. And so it goes. Increasingly, the only principle by international relations is absence of principle. And I know today that this past week, rising tensions between India and China. Now, many people are hailing BRICS as the future. The, the organization of these large, large economies outside of the G7. But in the last week, both uh, China, People's China and India have kicked out their respective journals. The tensions between those two countries have grown enormously in the past week. The conflict in Kosovo has exploded in the last week. You can go week to week and see that we're living in a world more and more engaged in conflict. And of course, that conflict is centered today in Ukraine. And it's, it's, a, it's a disaster meant to happen. How we look at that, I think, tells you a lot about this emerging era. And you can see it now going, uh, going, uh, going eastward in terms of provocations with China. Uh, the talk of the internet today is a People's China plane cut in front of a U.S. spy chain, a spy plane in the uh, South, South China Sea. And the Western press says it's a provocation. I would think the provocation would be what's a reconnaissance, a spy plane doing in the South China Sea that belongs to the United States, but that's the way it's twisted. But that's the world that we're looking at today. Now, for many people, I think, and it's a big mistake, they see this, this conflict that's occurring and they see the loss, the, the somewhat loss of US hegemony as a good thing. And perhaps it is a good thing. But they go further and say that we're entering a period, they characterize it as multipolarity, in which we're going to have agreements. So we're going to have uh, a level playing field, but everybody's going to get along because 
U.S. imperialism is going to be throttled. I think that's an illusion. I think that just cannot be the case. But I welcome any further discussion of that topic. I hope that generates some discussion today. But I think that's a very dangerous, dangerous development. I think uh, right at 45 minutes or 40 minutes. So why don't we take a break, I guess, and, and come back and take some comments and questions. Thank you very much, Greg. And um, you covered a tremendous amount of territory, um, very complex subjects, brought up some very important things. Uh, so th thank you very much. I'll be very much looking forward to the Q&A. Um, in our Q&A today, we, we ask people to limit their comments to about two, two minutes. And um, we'll, we'll need to unmute you, yourself when, when we call, call the call you. Um, we're looking for a stack of hands. So please raise your hands um, if you if you wish to speak in the Q&A. And um, I'll, I'll start with Richard Wright. If you would, Richard, unmute yourself and, 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 uh, and you have two minutes, please. Ready. I thought we were going to have announcements, but okay. Um, we, we, um, just very briefly on announcements, we usually announce the next program. Right now, um, we do not have a definitive next program, um, but by next Thursday at the latest, we will have um, an announcement on our next pro program. Uh, we have a number of irons in the fire right now. We just are confirming them. and. Um, We'll, we'll so keep keep um, posted on that, and um, Richard, why, why don't you begin? And Thank then, you. Uh, uh, that was a very nice talk, Greg. I I um, I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Um, in particular, um, the the these institutions, well, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank. Uh, they were really set up at a time when capitalism was just more or less becoming international. Uh, it's true that, that it was international before that, but really uh, the financial systems are at that uh, before then were were disparate and and um, uh, basically centered around uh, in the na nations. Uh, but my question is this, is that they, the capitalists have come up with uh, either be it bad or be it good or wrong or you know maybe it needs to be reformed. Uh, but anyways, the question is, is that labor has not done the same thing. Uh, I still find myself uh, uh, talking labor in terms of cities or states. Uh, you know, maybe you do have the, the national AFL-CIO, but there's a discernible lack of internationalism in international circles. Uh, and we really need to get be, uh, and we really need to get get with it. Uh, we need to fight uh, on on the on the same the same playing field as as the capitalists have, have been fighting on now for going on a hundred years. Um, could you maybe address that a little bit? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. And what you was saying, only one side is fighting the class struggle, and. Uh, the the workers side and its representatives. Uh, I, I don't think the workers uh, agree with this, but their side, their, their representatives aren't fighting. I mean, it's been the case, uh, as I mentioned, the kind of uh, unholy compact after 1945, 19 after the early 50s, when labor militant labor was defeated in the U.S. when the, the CIO was dismantled and uh, merged back into the NFL with the NFL and all those militant unions uh, were defanged. We got a labor movement that essentially would rather sit down at a table and come up to some kind of uh, sell some kind of agreement with capitalism. And that agreement was basically put crudely that if you give us a growth in wages and benefits that's commensurate with the growth in productivity in a period where productivity is growing, quite nicely, we'll be happy and we'll put our weapons aside. We're not going to fight with you. We'll just go along. And, and our part of the bargain is we'll keep the Reds out of the labor unions and we'll cooperate with your anti-Red 
uh, behavior internationally. We'll help you with the French communist, we'll help you with the Italian communist, and so on. So that was the world that labor inherited, labor still has inherited. And of course, capital being treacherous in 1980, uh, 78, actually uh, in the Carter administration and after, and accelerated, it said, to hell with that compact. We're not going to honor that. We, we need to get our, our uh, level of profitability back up. And they attacked labor. And of course, they were, you know, we were always promised around the corner is going to be a new wave. We get rid of Meany, things will get better. We get rid of, you know, we get the, what's the guy from SEIU who was going to be the savior of labor? I forget his name. Uh, that's going to change everything. And, and we're going to dump AIFLD, and that's going to change everything internationally. Again and again, the promises were there, but we need to fundamentally change labor. It's got to fundamentally change. It's, we, it's got to become the fighting force. It's got to be a force um, willing to deal with these times, willing to address these times. And you're right, international solidarity is a good place to begin. Uh, that's, that's, that's not to be found. Okay, Th thank you, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Richard. Um, Gene, you're, you're the next um, person, um, and unmute yourself. You are. Thank you, Gene. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes, you are. Right. Okay, well, thanks so much, Greg. This was uh, very, very interesting and challenging for me to understand the complexities of the capitalist economy. So uh, it was great, and um, as you know, today is the anniversary of uh, the day that uh, the Communist Party of China uh, over repressed the counter-revolutionaries at Tiananmen Square. Uh, and since that time, China has prospered and has become a major player in the world economy. And I'd like to, you know, we when we talk about the world economy, we tend to look at the United States and all the problems that United States has, but China is a fundamentally different uh, kettle of fish here because it is a socialist economy with a socialist mode of production, uh, as Stalin pointed out in his work. So, um, and so it's doing much different things internationally. And I'm thinking particularly of the Belt and Road Initiative in which it is making investments that raise the level of poverty uh, and increase it, uh, the independence of countries. And I'm thinking primarily of Africa, but the Belt and Road, I understand, has uh, 20 nations uh, in, uh, in the Americas have um, signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. So I wonder what your comments on that are, what you think about that and how that changes the whole thing and also the working class. Chinese working class is, after all, the largest working class uh, in in uh, the world, and many of us think it's also the most effective. So I'll uh, look forward to your response. Yeah, that's that's a big topic, isn't it? I mean, it's it's uh, and and uh, it's a little topic. Uh, I would say this. I I just saw a uh, a video of. Uh, the uh, annual Connolly, uh, Irish Connolly, uh, James Connolly Festival in Dublin. It's held by, organized by the uh, Irish Communist Party. And this year's featured speaker was Andrew Murray. You may know Andrew Murray from his leadership of the anti-war movement uh, uh, in, in England, in the UK. And also uh, in his, he was a close advisor to, uh, to the uh, last deposed labor uh, leader. Uh, quite an interesting guy, but he said, he, he talked about China and he said, you know, he says, China is a, either a capitalist country like we've never seen before or a socialist country like we've never seen before. And I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, I, I'm on that fence. I don't know exactly what kind of a beast China is. On one hand, one out of five Youngsters between 16 and 24 are unemployed today in, in People's China. On the other hand, they just finished a campaign a few years ago of essentially eliminating abject poverty. It's an incredible accomplishment. If you look at the major claims that the, that the capitalist uh, class claims for that period of neoliberalism and how they 
how they really wiped out poverty, went from like, uh, I don't know how many percent globally down to a, how many percent. All of it was in China. It had nothing to do with the rest of the world. It was all earned by China. China earned that. They did a remarkable job. But as I say, you've got one out of five young people unemployed, and you've got this incredible uh, uh, improvement of the lives of literally a billion people. So how, how we look at that, I don't know. You mentioned Tiananmen Square. The Chinese Communist Party is in charge. That was a great era of the Soviet Union that the Communist Party gave up its power. If it's going to try to figure out a new road, let it find that new road with the Communist Party in power, representing the interests of the working class. You will note that you seldom see class mentioned in all the discussions uh, uh, in China, the discussions that come up, public discussions and public statements. And it's not viewed as a country of the working class principally anymore. It's a non-class phenomenon. So there's some troubling things about China and there's some things to hail. As far as the Belt and Road goes, in the context of today's remnants of this last era of globalism and neoliberalism, it stands out. It stands out as an attempt to help countries. In terms of what the Soviet Union did, in terms of trying to help countries and the kind of aid it gave and assistance, it's not in the same ballgame, not in the same way. And we must remember that up until seven, in the end of the 70s, even into the 80s, the role of Chinese foreign policy was not a very glorious one. They supported, they supported UNITA with guns, with material support, Jonas Savimbi. They supported FMLA and Holy Roberto in Angola. They supported their counterparts in Mozambique and Guinea Bissau. They, they supported uh, movements that were killing Cuban international soldiers. And that has to be of concern to people who are trying to get a, a grasp of, of Chinese foreign policy and what it means and where it's going. I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by Xi. I think a lot of things he's saying now are a reflection of the failure of the right wing of the Chinese Communist Party to take China, people's China in a more capitalist direction. So I welcome that and I'm, I'm anxious to see where it goes, but I'm not ready, as I, I think you probably are, to announce that uh, what kind of kettle of fish it is. I'm not sure what the fish is. It's in a kettle, but I'm not sure what the fish is. Right, well, thank you. And I just note that, you know, China is, is very aware of its problems and, you know, does uh, take efforts to deal with it, but again, is supported by the Chinese people with something like a 90% uh, approval in contrast yeah. to a certain individual that we could mention. Absolutely. I, in fact, just, just to take a minute, I wrote about that. I wrote a piece that I took a public relations firm that's prominent internationally. I, I forget the name of it. And I looked at their studies and they did it to embarrass people here. All oh, oh, democracy, democracy. China was number one. Of all the countries, this public relations, it's a capitalist firm surveyed in terms of uh, approval. And I think that stands up in many, many polls. So that's worth stating. And I agree with that. And it, it does say a lot, doesn't it? It does. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I really do recommend people going to the um, Greg's blog and looking through it because there's a lot of good material there. Our next uh, person is Mario. If you could un unmute yourself. and. Um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, the question as far as why this economic system cannot revert back to a Keynesian system, I think you kind of quantified it with the QE ratios. It was kind of, the sound was kind of going out, but is it, from my understanding, well, can you explain that again? Is it just the lack well, it is of capital? Yeah, I, 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 yeah you, you make a good point, and I should have clarified that. It really is Keynes. They would never admit it, but that is, a, that is an interventionist approach to the crisis. It's very much akin to what Keynes would say. He would, he would, he would applaud that. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. But you're right. Well, I mean, I was just hoping you could kind of explain a bit more the transition to a speculative economy um, has, in a sense, created 
a playing field where there's a lot more um a lot more competition within the economic playing field so but why couldn't why couldn't this economic system for example decide to simply um depend more on a more centralized economy to bail out bail out um this crisis that we're in well essentially Quantitative easing as a policy has played out. Uh, it, it's it's it, there's no there's no um, payoff payoff for continuing it, for, for taking more of the garbage out because they've taken most of the garbage out. Um, by when you took the garbage out, bear in mind when you when the Fed Federal Reserve and the other central banks took this, what I call garbage, this crapola out and put in a lockbox, they paid for it. They put money into circulation. That's what inflation essentially is. It's money going back into circulation. Low interest rates put money into circulation. We're not on the gold standard anymore. It's just, it's just printed. And uh, uh, this printing created this kind of inflationary pressure. So they overshot, they tried to, 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 to rectify the deflation of the crash. That crash was imposed by massive speculation and super accumulation, which was directed into, let's call it fictitious capital, into these derivatives, these mortgages. They were, they were the payoff for these in terms of profitability were down the road. That's essentially the shift in capitalism when debt became a big factor. You had Jack Rasmussen on a couple of times ago. I reviewed his first book back at that time. And it was all about debt. It was a Minsky kind of approach to it. He understands it better than probably anybody I know. But debt is the kind of thing that is future producing. When you take a mortgage out, instead of paying $150,000 to buy the house, you pay $1,000 a month. So the payout comes at the end finalization of that. The whole financial economy is built that way as a kind of counterfactual. You'll get that at the end. When that collapses, there's nothing to get at the end. What do you do with it? It's garbage. You put it in a lockbox, but you buy it so the people that own it don't go under. So Wall Street was rescued by buying that. They took the money and they reinvested it. And we had the SPAC phenomena, which just collapsed which was another attempt to invigorate it. So what essentially Wall Street and the, and, and the Federal Reserve is trying to do is prop up things that are not uh, capable of sustaining themselves. They're in, in a state of collapse. And they, they succeeded in postponing that, but now the day of reckoning has come. Uh, it's just a factor of, of the weight of all that coming to bear. Am I missing your question? I, 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 um no but i mean i i think you answered it it's something that it needs to be analyzed more i'm sure people have responded in chat i'll take a look at that but um but the fact of the matter is is historically i mean this system this capitalist system has tried to rectify and um find new capital in ways of war in in furthering exploiting people ideologically, politically, um, I just wasn't sure of the economic foundations as far as the debt, the amount of um, the amount of debt that exists that would prevent the, you know, the system from simply um, kind of coming together and and trying to resolve things, bail out the speculative. speculative. Yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 let me be clear, because I don't mean to sound like a breakdown theorist, that I think capitalism is going to come and crash. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm, I'm going back to Joseph Schumpeter and saying the day of reckoning that created destruction is ahead of us, or it's proceeding normally, and that's the era and period we're in. And, uh, if it proceeds at a great cost to the working class, great 
cost to most of the people in this country, uh, capitalism can revive. A war can do that, just as the Ukraine war is having some of that kind of effect. It's certainly bolstering military Keynesianism. I mean, the, 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 the war making machinery in this country is in a, in a period of, uh, revel, of, of, of great joy. I mean, they're, they're, the products are being purchased and purchased and purchased and sent to Ukraine. So yeah, a recovery will, can come, it can, it can follow here. But we got to wring this out. People in 2010 and 11 thought it was wrung out. QE was supposed to wring it out. No, QE just postponed that reckoning. And now we're, we're getting the results of it. But, but of course, you're right, a big war can make everything clear the table and we'll start over. Capitalism will start over. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. And, and um, I do encourage people, because we are talking about some really complex economic questions. Um, it's, it's perfectly OK to raise your hand and say, please break that down. Please explain it a little bit more. Um, that's a little bit more accessible. Um, anyway, uh, our next um, stack is Norma, followed by Janet, followed by Rick. Uh, so Norma, if you could unmute yourself, please, and, and go. Hello. Uh, what I... <laughs> Uh, there are no rules for establishing, uh, for working toward communism. <laughs> and I think Xi is making them up very well as he goes along. Xi and China, uh, the government and the people of China, that we can't miss the point that to a degree, to a, as much of a degree as they can sort out, they know what's going on. So us standing at the perimeter and looking in and saying they were not doing it right. Well, this has been traditional for the so-called left for the past uh, 70 years, uh, ever since Cuba and, and all the rest of the nations. Uh, the thing is, you know, there's been a fight against the uh, 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 development of socialist and then communist efforts there, there's been a fight back constantly by the by our capitalist owners, and it's creeping in. Nevertheless, uh, communism is coming in, and the modifications that go on are very useful in, uh, to the degree that modifications are necessary in order to make things go along. Uh, the the one mandate that a socialist communist struggle uh, makes is that it is not allowed to attempt to overthrow the effort that is not permitted in the governments. And you've seen certain repression, you know, Cuba gets uh, told that it's supposed to allow uh, people to bomb their airplanes full of Cubans and such, and they don't, it's, it's not allowed. Also, I'd like to know if, uh, the speaker, I forgot, I've lost his screen. Uh, the speaker would tell us who the military person is in the photograph behind him. I like to support our heroes. Okay. The, the, the gentleman with the, uh, the, the hat on. Uh-oh, uh-oh. What did you say? My, my earphone was out. I, I saw that the gentleman with a hat on behind me. The, 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 that's a, a friend of mine did that painting for me, uh, a dear friend. That's Joseph Stalin. You may have heard of okay, him. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Greg, did you want to comment or should, should we go on to the next? Well, I thought that was the question. <laughs> no, it's, I, I, yeah, that's, let's go on. I, I answered okay. the question. Joseph okay. Stalin. So, so Janet, uh, if you could unmute yourself, please. Yes, okay, thank you, Greg. Uh, very uh, informative. Um, one second, I lost my, okay. So I have two questions. Um, could you talk about how the privatization of property over time fits into the history of capitalism, the growth of capitalism? Um, and then the second has to do with 
there was a, a, um, a BRICS foreign ministers meeting that just uh, ended in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and there is an addition of uh, something called Friends of BRICS, which is 12 developing countries. Uh, would you talk more about the growth of BRICS and uh, how it might be threatening uh, US hegemony and, and uh, talk about uh, the growth of multipolarity? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Um, first, privatization. It, it's a property is a, it's dialectic. The capitalists are interested in property when it benefits them, when they can profit from it. So they were never interested in public schools. They wanted to put the burden of public schools on the back of, to use one example, on the back of the people. So if you go back to the late 1900s, and all these immigrants coming from Europe and other places to work in the steel mills and the coal mines like my grandfather did. Um, the capitalist class wanted nothing to do with uh, the, the public schools. They wanted a minimal education for these workers to work on an assembly line or um, a coal mine. They didn't want the distraction. So public schools had to be paid for by the people. As, as industry evolved and developed, uh, that benefited them more and more. In our era, curiously enough, they want to run the schools. They want to privatize the schools. They want um, um, charter schools. They want, they want to grab it back, but they only want property when it benefits them. So during the 90s, in the era, of, back to the 80s and 90s, in the era we call globalization, we call neoliberalism, whatever, market fundamentalism. That was an era when they were taking back all of these things that were public owned before. They didn't want it, they didn't want them, they didn't want to develop or invest in them because they didn't see any profit. But now at that time, after the public had paid for these things and developed them so they could be profitable, they wanted to grab them back again and make a profit out of them. And that's a constant dialectic for capitalism. They want, they want stuff, they want to own stuff when it, they can make profit off of it, when it becomes a burden. For example, when a coal mine is depleted, can't be profitable, they want to walk away. They don't want to own that coal mine anymore. All that garbage, all that poison that's left in the soil, that becomes ours. We get it back. We don't want it, but we get it back. And that's the way that dialectic works. But I think you're probably more interested in bricks and multipolarity. BRICS is a good thing. It's a good thing because it does um, stand up to some extent against the US domination, which the US has owned since certainly 1945. The US has basically set the rules for the entire global economy and global culture, and lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. Everything, legal, you name it, the US has set that. Now there's resistance and we can thank Many um, governments throughout the world, progressive governments or popular governments, people's governments that have resisted, beginning with Cuba, of course, which has held out an incredibly long time, to shake and to begin to shatter that, that hegemony. That's a good thing. But you must remember, it's still capitalism that's the problem. It's capitalism which has its foot on our necks. And the, the notion that we can have an agreeable world in which US capitalism is defanged and everything is wonderful is an illusion. That's not the way capitalism works. Britain was an incredibly ugly, nasty, mean-spirited, dominant capitalist system for much of the 19th century. It ceded its dominance to the United States. We became the next caretaker of capitalism. But losing Great Britain as that dominant force um, uh, having a, a League of Nations in the wake of World War I didn't change the world. It didn't stop wars. It didn't stop competition. It didn't stop um, exploitation. And again, since the demise of the Soviet Union, many on the left have lost their confidence and faith in socialism. 
They've lost their confidence and faith, faith in a world and without exploitation, with, in a world in which whatever China is, that capitalist sector will also go away. They've lost faith in those things. And so today we look to things like BRICS as though it's a salvation, not the polarity like it's a salvation. It isn't. It isn't. And as we, if we follow in a Marxist way, a historical materialist way, the evolution of these stages, these eras of capitalism, to where we are today, we see what's ahead. It's more capitalism. And so th that's, that's the way I view it. I, I, I understand there's some people that believe in multipolarity because it will get US capitalism off of the back of some people who deserve to have it off their backs. Capitalism will still be there. And, and we in this country, we've got to stop finding surrogates for our struggles. The, the, the victories of the Chinese people are the victories of the Chinese people. The victories of the Cuban people are the victory of the Cuban people. Solidarity internationalism is great. We've got a battle here. We've got a working class here. We've got poor people here. We've got people that can't pay bills here. Uh, when they And so we have to develop a movement that is not just outward looking, but also inward looking to address these questions. Thank, thank you, Greg. And Rick, if, if you'd be. Yeah, th th thanks. I, I have some comments and some questions, so serious of things. Um, I think that we're living in a qualitatively different world now that greatly threatens the continuation of humanity. Um, there's, of course, a threat that we've had since World War II is the nuclear war, but also the environmental collapse. And maybe I missed it, but I didn't hear you talking anything about that at all, the environment and what's going on with it. With regards to China, now China may have wiped out poverty or abject poverty as you described it, but at the same time, they've created a number of billionaires. And I wonder if you would see that as compatible with socialism. I'd also like you to discuss China's lending policies to poor countries, the terms of their loans, the interest rate that's charged. And I question whether or not if that export of capital, at least I see it as such, is similar to what Lenin was describing in imperialism. Um, in addition, um, with China, I, I guess I'd like to know, are workers gaining more power in China, which I see as fundamental to socialism? And you know, I'm, I'm speaking from ignorance. I, I don't know, but I don't see signs of it when I read all these stories about the sweatshops there. So basically, I'm asking you to if you want to address the environmental threats and then these issues around China. I mean, it's, I find it often mind boggling that given what I was describing about China, that people would characterize it as a socialist country. So thank you. Yeah, those are, those are uh, good questions and difficult questions, very difficult questions. Uh, I, I plead guilty to, uh, in my writing, not today so much because I wasn't talking about things I think that are relevant to environmentalism, but in my own writing, I plead guilty to, to giving shorter shrift than I should to environmental questions. I mean, they're existential questions, and you're exactly right. Um, and within my group, Marxism, Leninism Today, and among my friends, I think we have to work much harder at, at coming up with an approach that combines Marxism with an understanding and appreciation of just how serious this issue has become. Uh, it, it, I am troubled by those that call themselves Marxists, perhaps are Marxists, but take a no growth position regarding the answer. I have in mind, I think the people at Monthly Review, though I'm not sure they all hold that view, but they're pressing a, a, a book now by a Japanese quote unquote Marxist named Saito, which is essentially a no growth approach. It's, it's just racist to take that approach without answering some critical questions. And that is, if we adopt no growth, what happens to all the peoples that are on the wrong end of uneven development? What happens to them? Are they supposed to just stop and live with their poverty, with their, with their uh, living standards with their life expectancy. To me, that's insanity. So we have to find a, 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 a Marxist position that's compatible with some kind of growth that will fill those voids and not, not force others to necessarily sacrifice to do that. 
at the same time address this crisis? And I confess, I confess I don't have the answer and I accept your criticism. And I, I hope we'll all work harder to, to, to achieve that. Could I just say growth? I mean, growth in our economy today means producing more and more crap that we don't need, more plastic, more military hardware, more cars, and on and on. So it, growth in itself is very detrimental to well, our is, continuation. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 yeah, and so yeah. you really have to talk about I mean, growth that meets people's needs as opposed to the producing more of the crap that we are that we, 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 our we, economy today. We need, we need you to explain that, not only to everyone here, but also people in the environmental movement, because the footprint of the US military, you know, gathering up empty bottles, empty water bottles is not the solution when you have a military that has an environmental footprint that's enormous. It's, it's unbelievable. Just curbing militarism, stopping the war in Ukraine. I mean, Every time you see an explosion, that's going into the air, you know, and people are, oh, that's good, you know. No, it's not. It's ugly. That's where we should begin. And you're right. The crap that we produce is another another example. Consumerism, which frankly was fostered in the post-war era, has to be addressed as well. On the other hand, I can't leave out all those people, the majority of people in the world, including masses of Chinese people who are better off but still not well off, that have to be brought up to a higher standard of living. And so, yeah, we got to do more on that one. But let me move on to your other question about China. As I said earlier, I'm I'm a fence setter. I don't I don't call China socialist. I don't call it capitalist. I go back to a British Marxist, R. Paul Madut, very prominent Marxist, uh, Indo Indo Brit, um, British Communist Party who wrote a pamphlet called Wither China back in the 60s. And he posed the question in terms of where China is going in regard to where it's been and where it is. And I try to make the same kind of distinction. The, the mechanical question of, is it socialist? Is it, is it capitalist? Is it imperialist? Is it anti-imperialist? Those are mechanical questions. They're not dialectical questions and they can't be answered dialectically in a simple way. I see the direction of China, particularly in the front, that the West is now giving them because they don't want China to ascend as a positive for the development of China. I think that is that is uh, uh, educated the Chinese Communist Party to the point where they're doing better things than they were perhaps 10 years ago. I see the Belt and Road thing as you put it, very as, as, as loans. In the end, it's capitalist loans. Now they've forgiven many, which is a positive, that's, that's a reality. They have forgiven some because it couldn't be paid, but it's not the same as the way the Soviets performed in terms of helping developing countries. They did grants, they sent their technicians, they built things, they charged nothing. They, they educated people in the Soviet Union to go and work in those countries, from those countries. It's well worth studying how they approached development in other countries. And ask the question about China, can't you be doing this? You're now a pretty, pretty, you know, wealthy country and overall. So yeah, I have my questions too. But just so you understand, my position is fence setting. I'm not going to defend. I'll let others defend specifics. And I don't want um, the last thing. Um, what about workers gaining more power in China? Because that to me is fundamental to socialism. Do you see that workers are gaining more power in China? Uh, I think that uh, I don't know. As, as one of the earlier commentators said, there's little we know when you're on the periphery looking into China, what do you have to go on? You have Western sources in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. I don't know. I don't know. It take it would take someone more intimate with that. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Greg. Um, if I could just interject really quickly. There was a metaphor that you used in one of your articles, Greg, which was very illustrious to, to me. Um, and that was in speaking about the role of China, you used a metaphor of the tiger. Could you could you share that with, with us? Because I thought it was a very good one. Thank you. Yeah. Riding the tiger. It's actually, it's my own <laughs> kind of weak, weak uh, uh, take, take on what the Chinese used to talk in the 60s about. Uh, about about developments, you know, riding a tiger and so forth. So 
I think what the Chinese Communist Party is doing is they're riding a tiger. They have an enormous capitalist class, and they do. And as an earlier speaker said, they have billionaires. And what do you make of that? How does the party have billionaires? And, and until a few years ago, they were allowed in the Communist Party. I, that's astounding to me that you would allow billionaires in the Communist Party. But when you take an analysis, when you take an assessment of where they are, they seem to be riding the tiger. And that itself is an accomplishment. And I, I tip my hat to that accomplishment, how, how they can do just that. So I hope they continue to ride the tiger and I hope they ride it better. Thank you. Uh, the stack now is, is um, Alan, Anne, Jean, and Norma. Alan, if you could um, go, please. Sure. Uh, thank you, Greg, for your presentation. Uh, what I think is particularly valuable about your talk is raising the big question of what, what's the nature of our historical epic? What are the changes that are taking place? Uh, and I think that that's a discussion that really needs to be at the center of our attention. And uh, we're not really talking about it enough. I, I really appreciate that you, you're, you're doing that. Um, something that I get very clearly from, from your presentation is that there is, in this period and the upcoming period, likely to be a, an intensification of class contradictions and class struggle here in the United States. And um, I wanted to ask you to comment on any ideas or thoughts you have about how the class struggle, the path of the class struggle will emerge in this upcoming period in response to this changing um, period that we're entering. I mean, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but you are somebody who grew up in the coal country. You certainly remember when the coal miners and industrial workers were a very large proportion of the uh, working class in this country. There's been a big shift towards service workers. Unions have declined. Um, do you have any thoughts or what are your thoughts about how the class struggle might unfold in the upcoming period? And I have other questions, but I'll come back to them later. Yeah, I, I, I like to think of myself as a Leninist, so I like to believe that you need a, a vanguard party, or at least a vanguard, and to have a vanguard, you have to have clarity about where we are and what's needed, and uh, we really don't have a vanguard party at this particular juncture. I'm sad to say uh, we have some beginnings of that. We have people with vanguard party mentality. They'd like to see it happen. But none of us have figured out exactly how to do that and, and build it. But but we we have to work very hard to get clarity about where we are. I appreciate your comments about about studying that. Whether I've got it right or not, I think I have. But whether I have or not, I think that project of going back to historical materialism and trying to figure out where we are is critical in going forward. Now. What are the obstacles? I mean, I don't have an answer. I don't have that party. I don't have that platform. I don't have that program. But what I do know is that the obstacles are glaring. One is a democratic party. We have to break our, our comrades and our friends from the stranglehold that party has on us and the wishful thinking that is embodied in that and the misdirection of our movements. We, we have to get over that. We have to, we have to deny the, the, and it's from the Democratic Party and its punditry and media, this demonization of the working class. You, you can't treat the working class as stupid, as Trumpites, as backward people, as people who uh, uh, are all racist. That's not the way to address the issues that, that have arisen. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are, there have always been elements of that. You go back and read accounts of the UAW in the 30s when they were organizing auto workers. The, the, the dominant force in those plants was the Black Legion. These were fascists. They would take organizers and shoot them and leave bullets on their chest to remind people that we're here. We're the Black Father Coughlin and so on. Anyone that imagines a romantic vision of a working class without elements of the right of, of confusion, of ugliness, of misdirection, 
They're, they're living a dream world. That's our working class. As Lyndon would say, that's what we have to work with. Let's work with it. But you don't find any of these, any of these movements showing any confidence or making any effort to reach them with alternatives. That's got to begin. Sad to say, we're really on a very, 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 very low level of, of advancing. But there's no other option in starting at that low level and trying to work, trying to get clarity. Uh, I hate to go in this direction, but there are so many misdirections the left has adopted. Uh, others can take on identity politics far better than I can, but I sense there's um, no limits to it. In other words, all the valuable things that have to be said in fighting racism and fighting uh, misogyny and fighting uh, uh, abuse of gays and so on, We've moved beyond many of those things into territory that becomes distractive, becomes way, way beyond what working class people understand and know. And working class people are the vast majority of people in this country. You know, it's it's not it's not their problem. Of course, all problems are their problem. But when you got to pay a mortgage, when you got to pay your your daughter or your son's uh, unit, uh, your college college uh, 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 bills. These things are not the central thing in your notion. So we've got to kind of put a perspective on how we go forward. We have enormous work ahead of us. And I hope that it begins by understanding. It begins by these kind of discussions and trying to get more clarity in where we're going. I hope we're bringing some of that today to, to, to people. Thank you. And you're next, please. Sure. Um, actually, it's a continuation of, of um, these questions, uh, Alan's question. I'm also, I spent 25 years in coal country and saw a rank and file movement that was quite amazing. And now see what's happened um, to that area of eastern Kentucky, and it's um, very disheartening. But um, my question, first of all, it seems to me that the solution for labor unions is not totally international solidarity. And we have seen instances of that. I mean, I think uh, the response of labor to South African apartheid was profound um, and a profound struggle on the part of the US labor movement. Um, so I'm not um, as convinced, and I'm also concerned about the role of identity politics, which I think you're, you're expressing, Greg. What I wonder is where do labor unions fit in these days? I'm living in a state which is less than 5% organized. Um, and do we still see that there is the potential of, of uh, labor unions as the organization of work of the working class? Yeah, there's, you know, we, we probably all know about Amazon and, and uh, um, coffee shop. I'm going brain dead. The coffee shop that's being organized, uh, national chain. Uh, there, there are elements in the service sector. They're developing independent unions. It's a long way from getting where we want to be, but those are positive developments. Um, and they're unfortunately, I wish it could be more positive. But the, the labor leadership in this country at the top is really taking us nowhere. And and the problem really is not only my brief explanation of how they came out of the militancy of the 30s and 40s and early 50s and how that was sold down the river, it's not just that. It, it, it's, it's that uh, the links to the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is a scourge on the labor movement. Uh, the labor movement gave its independence up to the Democratic Party so many years ago and it's never broken away. As long as it tails the Democratic Party, we get nowhere. And frankly, I don't, I don't argue it here, but I'm not convinced that your, your profound influence on apartheid is really accurate, but we needn't, you know, I could be wrong. But where do we go from here? Well, we have to, we have to, as Lincoln said, we have to accept the labor unions that we have, and we have to try to work within them. MLT, we have some folks that are involved in these new developments. They're trying to bring fosterite class struggle unionism into the trade union movement and the fringes of it, we're into the mainstream. We need a, we need a movement organized, not just labor notes, because they're not really, that's not their approach, but brings the old foster notion of class struggleism 
back into the labor movement, fundamentally fighting the boss. You know, fight the boss at every turn. That's got to be back, injected back into the labor movement. And I think some of these young people will get some experience and they'll take that back in. But that's a long-term project. But you're absolutely right. We have to go back to the fundamentals and the labor, the labor movement must play that role. They must be, it must be reinvigorated and it must play that role uh, once again. Um, I just wanted to clarify. I don't think that the U.S. labor movement created an end to apartheid for a moment. Um, but I do believe that ordinary working people got involved in questions sure. of international solidarity. I mean, they stopped. The coal miners stopped. The dock workers stopped. I mean, it was a pretty major. Yeah, yeah. And there was a strike against a, um, a coal mining company here uh, against A.T. Massey because they had ties to South Africa, among other things. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that's, and again, you, you would hope, and, and one still hopes, that those kind of things, when they happen, like the longshoremen who have a long history, they keep alive to some extent the old CIO tradition that I'm, I'm missing, that I'm, I'm regretting was, was stifled. Uh, they kept that alive. You, you would think it'd be a model for the rest of the labor movement, but it never captured that, never became that model in our time. Maybe it will in the future. You read to some extent, and not, not as much as they'd like to believe, but to some extent, they kept it alive. And there are other strings of that. We have to appreciate that, and we have to hope that there'll be uh, there'll be labor federations, that there'll be locals that will, it'll dawn on them. We've got this long history, long tradition of fighting. Let's get back to it. And, and we can help. We can, we can take that history to workers. And that's an important role. It doesn't, it doesn't sound revolutionary, but it is. Take that history. Take uh, uh, Linda Mortimer's book. Take uh, Linda Coe's book. You know, take... Uh, uh, them and us from the UE and labor's untold story to workers, they, they'll, they'll appreciate it, they'll understand it. Knowing your history, just as it has been with, with African Americans, is a, is, a, is a material boost to fighting. And so there's a lot of things we can do, and we must do that. Thank you. Um, let me just interject real quickly, Greg, uh, and ask for a clarification on your, your comments. Um, when you speak about the labor movement, um, are you talking about the existing unions? The reason why I ask that question is that there is elements on the left right now who are saying that the existing labor unions are so corrupt that we have to give up on them. Um, and what is your view on that? Well, I mean, I hope you don't understand uh, bitterness towards the leadership with giving up. It's far from that. I mean, we have to, uh, insofar as uh, the leadership does on occasion stand up, we have to encourage that and support it. And, you know, people can change. I don't think they will, but eventually they're going to have to go. But they're only going to go if we participate, uh, if, we, if we get involved. Uh, you know, and historically, Foster understood this well. I mean, Foster, Foster tried different approaches, different approaches to affect the direction of the existing labor movement in order to make it better. Never gave up on it. At some points he said, well, look, I, I can't say we can make any inroads. Let's do some independent unions. But he didn't give up on it. it the, the project was still to bring the labor movement forward. And insofar as we try these things, you know, Amazon could be one way. Uh, we had in the communist movement, the TUAD, it was recently as the 60s and the 70s, which was a trade union, action and de for democracy movement, which was brought the more advanced trade unionists into together in order to develop a program that could affect the labor movement. Um, the Labor Party advocates, which I was involved in, I was a delegate to the convention. That was a positive, uh, a positive development too. Unfortunately, the conditions were not there for it to continue. And to some extent, it was dropped, unfortunately. But those were positives. And we have to develop more things like that that will affect the labor movement. They remain one of, our, one of the central things that can advance us, maybe the most central thing that can advance us. Right, th thank you. Uh, so the stack right now is Jean, Norma, Richard, and Sharon. Jean, please. 
Well, I, I just note that Sharon has her hand up and she hasn't spoken yet. That's very, very well. Uh, and, and then we uh, uh, take yes, Sharon first. Sharon, and then go. Why, why don't you go next? Uh, unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that in this new era that emer has emerged or is in the process of, of emerging, we should think about the factor of migration, which is huge. And it's caused by war, fascistic regimes, and climate change. I'm sure there are other factors. And um, it seems to me that, um, that we need to think about the effects of migration, and in particular in the United States, the, the effing capitalists don't even work in their own self-interest. And it would they keep say they they say they they illustrate or talk about the fact that the working class is shrinking, that they don't have en enough workers, and yet they um refuse to change immigration policy. And the Democrats are the are as bad as the Republic, there's no difference. Um and we I think that the demand for Immigration reform should be up there on our list of of things to organize around. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you, you, Sharon. You you, you underscore uh, some of the insanity of capitalism. You're right. If you read Thomas Friedman in New York Times uh, a year ago, you'd say, "Oh my God, uh, AI and robotization and all this is going to." Put everybody on the streets. Workers can't do anything. And to some extent, we have a precariat. I, I think Rasmus, when he was on, said it very well. I enjoyed his his presentation. I, I think a lot of him. Um, but but it isn't the case. We actually have a labor shortage today. I mean, and, and overall, as you saw the the figures that came out last week, three hundred thirty nine thousand uh, uh, new jobs created. No one can understand this. They're they're shitty jobs, but they're being created. And this, from the capitalist point of view, would, would, would relieve some of that pressure. Of course, we shouldn't be in the business of managing capitalism for them. The immigration issue is a complicated one. It's complicated because as a Marxist, we should go to the source. Why are people leaving? Uh, they're not leaving Nicaragua. They're leaving the other countries around Nicaragua because Nicaragua has, uh, if, if anything, a labor shortage. It has uh, ample jobs there. Let's develop the economy in the right direction. But these other countries are capitalist countries that are failing. They're failing miserably. In the case of Cuba, a lot of there are a lot of Cubans. It's failing miserably because our embargo, our, 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 our uh, denial of an economic life for Cuba, our strangling of Cuba is forcing people to leave. They can't make a living there. That has to change. That's the answer to Cuban immigration. In Venezuela. The answer is in the Venezuelan economy and so on. So that, that's where we have to go as Marxists. We have to go to the source of causing people to leave their homeland. Immigration, my grandmother, when she was dying from Italy, she says, we thought the, the streets were going to be paved with gold. They weren't. I regret leaving Italy. And it, it told a tale. They didn't leave because they wanted to leave. They liked Italy better, but they had no jobs. And we should try to devise a policy that keeps people at home. So throwing the, throwing the borders open, that's a kind of EU approach. You know, We don't want to have borders in the EU, so let everybody come and move around. It's not really the solution. On the other hand, abusing immigrants, forgetting about their needs, uh, not finding room for them when they, they're, they're, seriously, they're seriously hurt if they go home, that's a whole different issue. So we left it in the hands of the Democrats and the Republicans. So what do you expect? There can't be a sane immigrant policy coming out of our two-party system. There just can't be. Thank you, Gene. Yeah, okay, well, th thanks. I really appreciate this. Let me just say, I, I've, uh, I'm a retired uh, union member, still have my dues deducted from my retirement check, and also say that here in Oakland, uh, we have the IL ILWU, uh, very strong union, very radical union, and they provide an anchor, I think. They can shut down the port, 
whenever they feel like it, basically. And uh, they're, they're uh, not only an anchor for the labor movement here uh, in Oakland, but also for the whole left movement. So I just want to make, we're in a privilege, in this sense, very uh, good position here. But I wanted to raise a question, uh, shift gears a little bit, because I wanted, we have our homegrown socialist here uh, in the United States, Bernie Sanders. And, uh, you know, Bernie uh, has done so much in terms of changing politics in the U.S. He's, as a candidate, he's gotten more votes than not only any other socialist candidate, but all other socialist candidates in U.S. history combined. And he's changed the discussion so that if you look at youth today um, and ask them, what do you prefer, capitalism or socialism? The majority of young people say they prefer socialism to capitalism. And that's a very significant change. And I think a lot of people uh, don't give Bernie credit for the changes he's made in US politics. And he's always supported the labor movement also, I would say. So I just, and maybe a little bit, not as good on foreign policy as we would like, but uh, uh, he, he's, a, he's a good man. I just wanna, Get your fit, fit, uh, opinion on that. Yeah, it's it's and this group will appreciate its dialectics. I mean, he he shows what possibilities are and the limits are to being a Democrat. He he, show, he shows the possibility introduces the possibility of socialism to millions of people, and he shows the limitations of being a Democrat to millions of people. That's the contradiction of Bernie Sanders, but it is a contradiction. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have it here, and we also have the uh, DSA, D Democratic Socialists in America of America. They're making an impact on politics in a lot of very in very innovative ways. They're they're a good group. Well, I think they they've become a feeder now for some of the more left groups because they show again the limitations of that form of leftism. They're like a revival of the new left, riding on the back of Bernie Sanders and and youth youth's interest in socialism. So they, they, they've they exploited that. They've exploited those possibilities that were opened up. But I don't think they're faring very well. I know that uh, here, those candidates that were elected as Democratic Socialists and ran in the Democratic Party have renounced their D DSA membership. Not because they're angry at them, they just don't want to be identified with socialism anymore. They have the ambition that the Democratic Party brings to people that are elected to, to office. So again, we see both the limitations exposed and the possibilities. So we as Marxists, we should try to develop on those possibilities that they've opened up. But we should not, we should understand you can only go so far with Bernie Sanders. Let's take, let's take for example, Medicare for all. Bernie's the chair of a committee that could introduce that as the chairperson of that committee in the Senate. He's been there for two years. His first statement was, that's not on the table. And then two weeks ago, with a House that's now Republican, he introduces a Medicare for all bill. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's dishonest. It's, it's just an attempt to shepherd young people and socialist minded people, more radical Democrats, left Democrats, back into the Democratic fold, and to run on that in election when they know they have no possibility of getting a vote because the Republicans would not uh, let it happen. He could have put this on the floor two years ago when it could have passed the House. Didn't do it, wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. so it's, it there's no reason to get mad about it. I'm not, I'm not mad about it, but it certainly exposes the limitations of Sanders and the, and the phenomena. Right, and the Medicare for all business, you know, People are talking about that, but they're not talking about single payer like they have in Canada or a national health service like they have in England or, heaven forbid, the Cuban system, which is the best medical system in the world by common consent and the cheapest. Yeah, thank you. I, I think um, we have 11 minutes left. And so um, our next uh, person is, I'm going to call people out of order because Sheila hasn't asked a question yet. So Sheila, um, why don't you unmute yourself and then Norma, then Richard. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you very much. And, and thank you for this forum. 
Um, one thing I, I um, would like to uh, mention is the African People's Socialist Party, um, which uh, has been making inroads in the black community, which is of course why it was attacked viciously by the FBI in a, you know, in reminiscent of uh, COINTELPRO. And of course they're under indictment of and, and facing up to 15 years in prison. Um, the other thing is um, if, you know, I, I've attended a, a couple of these forums and I think it's a great to hear Marxist ideas. And if, I know you're based in California. So if you would like to hear more of this on your radio station, KPFA, I would recommend that people hurry up and become members by June 30th so that you can vote in the upcoming elections for the board. Uh, because I'm, I'm disturbed at KPFA for putting Ian Masters back on the air, who is uh, whom some people consider a mouthpiece for the CIA. Uh, he's, uh, you know, a, a, a supports uh, Israel. He um, thinks, uh, he, yeah, he thinks Fidel is a, was a dictator. He's anti-Cuban. He's uh, uh, anti-Venezuela. He supports the, you know, the war in Ukraine, et cetera. And I know this forum has been very good about giving alternative views about the war in Ukraine. And uh, I personally would like to hear more of that on all of Pacifica stations, including the views of black Marxists like the African People's Socialist Party. So it's really important because Pacifica is democratically controlled by their local and national boards that uh, we all participate in, in those airwaves to uh, you know, help keep it a truly um, alternative media. Um, but if, if uh, we have time, if, if you would like to comment on the African People's Socialist Party. Thank you. I, I, I endorse that. I, I, I've been a regular subscriber to their, uh, uh, their work. I mean, they, they, I get a virtually da daily update from, from them. And I was really uh, kind of in awe, uh, <laughs> selfishly, because they're Marxists. I mean, they, they study Marxism-Leninism, and they're a force in what they do. And I suspect that's also part of the reason that they were attacked. Now, they, I think there's some charges around RT or something. Well, that's just part of the whole scam around our, you know, we live in a country, a country that used to brag about how freedom of speech and freedom of ideas and you can't even get RT in this country. You can't get alternative uh, media in this country. So I have no idea how they got tangled with RT or whatever, but that's that's bogus, that's just BS. But uh, yeah, it's cutting edge, edge and it, we have to involve more of a left in that struggle, that defense, uh, that defense uh, uh, against the FBI. I'm, I'm just alarmed at how people in this country, particularly in the soft left, the Democratic Party and so on, that have made the FBI and the CIA into heroes. They watch those stupid TV shows where they're heroes. And so it, 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 it infects their thinking. Well, the FBI is accusing the, the, uh, the, the party of uh, this or that. It must be true. I mean, God, if you don't have an FBI number attached to your name, I question your credentials as a Marxist or a socialist or as a radical. I know my two numbers. I got two. How many do you have? I mean that to everybody. I don't mean it's just you. Th thank you, Greg. And um, probably some, uh, many of you heard the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru Support Movement, who was on um, th this platform two weeks ago. And uh, do recommend if you if you didn't to go back to our website and listen to the the, um, the, the video of that, which is excellent. Norma, you're next. Please, please unmute. Carl. Carl, Carl nuts carl kreplin had his hand up do you want to ask him if he still wants to talk i i don't see his if hand not, up. i'll be good oh <laughs> carl did do you want to speak i i don't see his hand up and um okay okay I'll well i'll just uh, i posted my commentary in the chat it it demands the acknowledgement that the soviet union was attacked for a hundred years by the Imperium, 
that if we don't acknowledge, you know, and it, and it had World War II against it, uh, encouraged by our owning class that demanded that or that supported Hitler marching south to go topple the Soviet Union. So establishing a just society under these limitations, thank goodness for Stalin and all the work that he did do or was able to do before he wasn't able to do it anymore. But I posted my comment into the chat if you want to look at it. Okay, thanks, Richard. You're, you're next, please unmute. And then well, Greg, yeah. make some summary uh, comments. You, you, you'd be welcome to do that. So, so 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 many so many questions and so little time. Um, I really do. I have a half dozen questions here. Um, but I wanted to get back to something that Raj put in the chat and wasn't addressed. Uh, and I thought it was a very good question. And that is, um, there seems to be a change in the underlying uh, fundamentals of capitalism, uh, basically since, we'll say, World War II. Um, and um, I was wondering maybe you could address that. Uh, uh, because I think, you know, well, anyways, I'll just let you take that, if you would, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, there was a lot of uh, static in the left in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. A lot of academics that wanted to make a career on challenging Lenin's theory of imperialism. And uh, they talked about the, the decline of the nation state and the role of transnational corporations. and. Essentially, what you're saying, uh, the fundamental changes in capitalism away from that Lenin structure. I think that Lenin structure is intact. I think we need to view the world today as, um, as a reflection of that exact capitalism that Lenin talked about based upon monopoly capitalism and how it functions. We need to get clear on what monopoly capitalism is. Sweezy and Peron were not clear on it when they wrote their book. They thought it was essentially a snapshot of the US economy in 1965 and 66. That aside, it's still, it's still the same classic uh, economy of monopoly capitalism with a strong financial sector, et cetera, et cetera. There's been a change in division of labor. We've got uh, now finance sector located in the United States. A, dominant, a service sector dominant in the United States, manufacturing gone. But these are what I call era changes. These, these are shifts that were based upon issues that rose up in capitalism's course, which were addressed by capitalist elites to put capitalism back on the rails. They were, they were uh, policy changes, essentially, going forward. They were structural changes, but fundamentally the Productive forces grew and they grew and they grew, but monopoly capitalism remained the overriding structure of capitalism through that period. But of course, we got to attend to those changes that, that do occur era to era, like the ship in, after the 1970 and 1980 crisis, capitalism morphed. If I, if I could interrupt real quick, Greg. Yeah. Um, there's been a rise, though, uh, a transformation from uh, from uh, industrial capitalism, which is what Marx analyzed. Uh, and, and at that time, it was just becoming, uh, it, was, it was just being born, really. There's been a shift from that into more of a services and more uh, um, um, computerized. Uh, and uh, and I, I was just, I mean, that, that to me seems to ch change the whole, the whole terrain that, that, we're, that we're talking about. Well, I think, again, you've got to look at the trajectory of capitalism globally and not just from the United States perspective. Globally, the manufacturing that was here went somewhere else. And so it, it, from, from a myopic view, looking through the lens of the United States, manufacturing is tiny percent of what it was um, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. But that manufacturing went to China, it went to India, it went to Vietnam, it went to Eastern Europe, it, it went to other places. That reservoir of cheap labor is where it went, but it's still there. The global working class is enormous. It's huge. It's, it's industrial locus 
is not here anymore, but it's somewhere else. But it's a huge working class. And now our working class is less manufacturing and more service sector. You're right about that. But globally, the mix is pretty close to what it was when Lenin was writing. Uh, and it's dominated by monopoly industry, but also a host of other industries that are subservient and below that. And industry shifts. So when people talk about monopoly, they think that, well, we go from five to four to three to two to one. No, it doesn't work that way. And, and even when it does go down to three or four major monopolies, it also competes with new industries that arise. So we have a general abundance of new businesses, new corporations going forward. Competition begets um, monopoly and monopoly begets competition. And that's something that many people forget. Competition does not go away with monopoly capitalism. But thank you very much, Greg. Are there any sort of final words that you'd like to wrap up with? Well, sure, and, and very briefly, I appreciate it today very much, the opportunity to spread this uh, view forward and have a discussion of it because I've written, but I haven't engaged with anybody really on it. Um, I think in general, it, it's, it's perhaps, as you said many times in the course of this, it's a very complex issue and it involves many, many things, far too many things that we could discuss in two hours, but it's something I will continue to work on and try to put together in terms of a bigger picture. Um, and I hope uh, you all continue to think about these issues and think about how we can address them. That's the most important thing. That's what I'd like to leave you with. How do we address these? How do we go forward? How do we fix, not capitalism, but fix our world with socialism? How do we get there? Thank you. Back, thank you, Greg. And I hope you'll consider coming back and sharing some more of your thoughts with us. And I want to thank everybody who, who participated today. Have a good day and see you next week. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S U N D A Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California. 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F A L L E N B A U M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org. And the website is marxistlibr.org.